Yes. Uh, ready for our, our next session. Hope you enjoyed uh, our, our previous session on executive leadership during in this post-pandemic environment. This is uh, a, a session that I'm so excited about. It's called Building a Lasting Legacy. Uh, we're going to be uh, having a conversation with three very distinguished uh, leaders who have built a lasting legacy during their careers at their companies and continue to do great things uh, as they uh, uh, move into their next chapters uh, within their uh, professional careers as, as retired executives. Um, and also helps to give you an idea of where you can go as you're looking to rise up the corporate ladder and the legacy that you will leave at your company once you're at that stage when you're ready to retire and move on to um, uh, a future uh, professional career, whether serving on boards or just doing things within the community. So let's get started. Um, here to moderate is my good friend. She serves on the Ased Board of Directors. Uh, she was formerly the Vice Chair and doing amazing work as the President and Chief Executive Officer of MANA a national Latina organization. Please welcome our moderator who will introduce our panelists, Amy Hinojosa. Thank you so much, Sid. It's always a pleasure to be with our friends and familia at ACER. Um, and we hope that um, you are all still safe and healthy at home as we find ourselves at, hopefully at the end of, of this pandemic. And, and hopefully this is one of the last few times um, we encounter each other via um, via virtual setting. Hopefully soon we can all be together, um, you know, giving hugs and, and, and talking and, and enjoying each other's company the way that we have for so many years. And it's great to be here with all of our friends um, in the SED programs. So we're so excited to have this conversation today. We have three incredible, illustrious professionals who um, have really built not not only their own personal professional careers, but have really set the stage and laid the groundwork for a lasting legacy, right? So that our community can continue to grow and benefit from their work and their achievements. And, you know, it, it's a way of paying it forward. So this conversation is going to be around how to build that lasting legacy um, in your own work. So if, if you could help me welcome, we are so thrilled to have Grace Liebline, Board Director of Honeywell International, Southwest Airlines and American Tower. We're also pleased to welcome Julio Portalatin, Board Director for State Street, and Eduardo Martinez, President of the UPS Foundation. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, you know, I, I want to get started and kind of lay the, the framework for the conversation. It's been said that a corporate leader's legacy can be found at the intersection of business performance and workplace culture. This does this statement speak to your experiences, or or would you change that slightly? Grace, please start us off. I I think it's accurate, um, but I would modify it just a bit and add people development um, in the mix. My goal when I came into an organization uh, was always to leave it in better shape than when I entered it. And I always felt that developing people was a huge part of that because it's really the people who are gonna sustain your legacy and really the culture. So um, I think it's a good statement, but uh, I think people development uh, really needs to be there in that, in that mix. Julio, would you uh, care, to, care to take a stab at that one? Sure, I, am I supposed to be unmuting myself? Okay, there you go. So uh, I, I think in its totality, there is some very good um, saying when you talk about those two aspects. But when you're a when you're trying to change lives, I think there's a lot of things that come into doing that, and you're trying to figure out authentically how you can have an impact, a positive impact on people's lives, while still delivering good results, and while still incorporating a change culture that allows for people to be themselves, to bring themselves to work in a totality. And I think that that is a broader perspective as you think about legacy and the different things that happen outside of our company walls, which impact the world that we live in inside our company walls. And so the broader, uh, the broader aspect of this is how do you improve people's lives and how do you ultimately bring that as being part of your culture? 
so that people see that as being an, a, an employer that they want to stay with, that they want to continue to grow with, and ultimately be proud being a part of it. Thank you. Eduardo? You know, I, I think, first of all, I agree with the statement, and I think one follows the other. You know, there's this old saying that says, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Well, when I look at culture of a company or any institution, you look at the, the people, the people development, the community engagement, the engagement of, of, of your people. And if you get that right, then your business results will follow. And so I think one, you can't have, I don't believe, one without the other for the long-term sustainability of any organization. You have to get the culture right. If you do that, your business results will follow. <clears throat> yeah. Julio, let's take a step back uh, uh, on the conversation. You know, as you're working your way through your career, there's a mind shift that takes place where you realize that it's not just about you and your, your individual accomplishments, but then it becomes this larger conversation of how you can build structures that help your community as well as help the business, right? So can you talk a little bit about where that transition comes and how um, you adjust to that as a leader? Great question. So first, let me say that a leader has to be in tune to the vast changes that are taking place externally and internally in order to continue to build an organization that motivates people to want to work and stay at the organization. And one of the ways you do that and became more important as time went on is to develop a clear purpose of why a organization exists. Something that people can be proud of being part of something that really elicits some sort of emotional attachment as opposed to just coming to work and doing the type of work that is necessary to be seen as contributing. There's something greater than that. There's something more that we have to do. And purpose usually does that. Spending a lot of time on purpose, having an individual and employees involved in that purpose and the execution of the culture that's necessary to not only engage that culture, but to thrive in that culture, I think is an incredibly important part when you think about the crossroads of developing something that's long lasting, that ultimately is gonna be seen as something special and that ultimately employees will look at and embrace and put their arms around. So Eduardo, in that, in that vein, what would be your recommendation to the folks watching the, this conversation of how they make that um, whether it's an adjustment, whether they make changes to, you know, to how you begin to build uh, that legacy in your own work. Well, I mean, I think getting back to Julio's point, uh, the, the most important, I believe, the most important point that a leader can do in an organization, in a division, is to have a clear purpose uh, that the employees, the partners, the associates can connect to so that they understand that their work is not just about chasing profits and that the institution is a lot more than just bringing a return to the shareholders. And that's where you really become an institution that's, that's really more about its people, its communities, its suppliers. And that way you're really creating a legacy by improving the lives of all of those stakeholders. You know, it's, it's a great example that happened a, a few years ago, and it's, it really was led by Larry Fink and his famous letter about uh, stakeholder capitalism, right, where the Business Roundtable expanded the scope of their mission from just being about shareholders to being about the community, the customer, the employees, and suppliers. And, and I think that if a leader follows that, that path, they will, by default, create a huge legacy because you're improving the lives, not just within the walls of your organization, but also around the world, potentially. Grace, as a, as a woman and a Latina, you know, it, it, as a leader, it, there are so, it feels like the weight of the world sometimes is, <laughs> 
efforts in that regard. Um, and can you talk a little bit about um, why it's so meaningful to, to build a, a legacy, um, particularly when you know you have so many people counting on you, really? Yeah. It, it, that's a great question. And I, I think um, one of the things that, that I did when I was uh, working at General Motors and through my career is I didn't so much uh, have this idea of, you know, here's going to be my legacy and, and this is how I'm going to build it. Later on in my career, I, I, I really, um, I'll say, set the foundation for that. But I think, you know, to Julio and to Eduardo's point, you know, a lot of it is purpose. And then I think the other really important point is around values, um, because I think that if you uh, if you can keep in your mind, you know, what your values are and and, you know, ensure that the organization that you're working with um, is also aligned around those values that, you know, you can do incredible things and build a legacy, you know, based on that. Um, yeah, I, uh, when I worked at General Motors, I was the first um, in a, a number of positions. I was the first woman to run a proving ground. I was the first Latina to be president of GM Mexico. And there's always, um, there is always some extra responsibility when you're first. Um, and I'm sure Julio and Eduardo uh, had the same experiences. Um, like you said, it's a little bit of the weight of the world on you because you know, you're, um, you know, you're really paving the way for those that follow you. But um, you know, what I tried to do in those circumstances is get in the job, listen to people, Un, you know, understand quickly what needs to be done, again, aligned to values, and then you build your credibility from there. Um, you know, being the first, uh, you know, there's there's some expectations that come with that. Some people have positive expectations, some people have negative expectations. And, you know, I always, in, in my um, experiences, I tried to put the people who had the negative expectations out of my window <laughs> and let my uh, performance, you know, build my credibility and, and go from there. Um, but I, I do think it is, it, for me, it all starts with uh, a clear um, vision of your values. Absolutely. Ed Eduardo, you know, there are, I think everyone who is in a leadership role knows that um, there's a solitude to it sometimes, you know, sometimes the buck stops with you. Um, but there is such an important place for mentorship. Um, and I'd love for you to talk about the importance of, that mentorship has had on your career and then how you build mentoring into um, making sure that you're cultivating that next generation of leaders coming behind you. Right. Well, I, I think mentorship is is hugely important has been very important in my career, but I think mentorship comes in all shapes and sizes. I know, you know, I started unloading packages at UPS when I was 16 years old, okay? And at that time, you know, I, I was working next to folks that, you know, would, would teach me about the business, would teach me about the basic entry level job that I had. And, and so I think, that in, in those kind of situations, you really have to be a good listener. You have to learn from others. You know, that's, that's kind of very basic. But in a way, those kernels, those kernels of knowledge and experiences that one can pick up from others are extremely important. Now, you fast forward to today, and I believe that mentorship has to be more intentional in organizations, that it can't be about passing the baton necessarily, but organizations have to have formal mentorship programs. Why? Because quite frankly, the amount of business disruption, the amount of technology that's being used now to supplant uh, human interaction, uh, people in order to develop themselves and mentors to develop others have to be more intentional. And so I think that over my 44 year career at UPS, I have been mentored along the way in many, many different forms. 
uh, that I certainly, you know, owe a, a big debt of gratitude to those uh, partners that did so. But I think organizations today, whether it be a civil society, government, private sector organizations, have to be more intentional and mentorship programs have to be more formalized in order to develop your people and identify talent. <clears throat> Grace, would you care to share your experiences with mentorship? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, it's interesting, I never had a formal mentor in 37 years at General Motors. However, uh, as Eduardo said, I had lots of people who really helped me, coached me uh, along the way that I consider mentors. Um, I'm not sure if you asked them if they would have said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm her mentor. Um, in my mid-career, I had one leader that uh, pushed me to take positions that got me out of my comfort zone, even when I was very hesitant to, uh, to do so. And I look back on those positions now and see that I really grew both personally and professionally as a result of those experiences. Um, and so I uh, really took it upon myself um, as a woman and a Latina um, to, uh, to, to you know, find people in the organization uh, and, and mentor them uh, because I, I think it is important. Um, and you know, to Eduardo's point, I think um, having formal mentoring programs is uh, very effective. I think it can be done informally as well, um, but that means that um, the protégés really have to be proactive about it and, and look for um, that mentorship, uh, which, which again, I, I think is very important. And uh, just one more point, I always thought about uh, mentorship as not only somebody who was senior in, uh, to me in, in position um, to be my mentor. I mean, I, I uh, worked with people who were uh, junior than me um, and, uh, and we developed a, a mentoring relationship and I learned as much from them as, uh, as I think you know, I was able to, to help them. So, so I, I would encourage folks to not only think of mentors as kind of your sponsor that is you know, somebody high in the organization, but there's all kinds of mentors. There's people who can give you feedback. There's people who can help you understand what's going on in a part of the organization that you're not working um, and that may be junior to you. So, you know, I like to think about mentorship in a very, very broad perspective, um, you know, formal, informal, um, and, and really at all levels. Yeah. Julio, that reminds me of, of your point um, earlier of being a listener, right? And really listening to what's going on around you. So tell us about your mentorship experience. The first thing, as far as legacy is concerned, there is nothing more important that we can contribute to the future of people's success and to building Latina and Latino leadership in corporate world than taking it upon ourselves to be responsible for doing just that. And one of the major ways that you effectuate that is by being active in coaching and mentoring as you see people who are in need of that particular skill that you can bring to their development. And I, and, and I think when you think about legacy, you can't speak about legacy if you haven't spent a lot of time doing exactly that and saying to yourself, it's my job, it's my accountability, it is my responsibility. If you sit there as a CEO, 2012, you join a large corporate board, you become the CEO of 25,000 people, and all of a sudden you find yourself with a set of priorities that have to be done. And if on that priority list, it's not about what does the mentorship program look like today? What does the coaching program look like today? What formal and informal directive, directives do we have to encourage this participation throughout the organization? then I think you're missing on a huge opportunity around people and around making your organization special. You have to dedicate yourself to it. And it's been a pleasure doing it. And today, even today, as I see myself in a post full-time role, I've got probably 25 people that I engage with on a regular basis 
Most of them, I'm happy to say, are Latina and Latinos. In fact, the last five conversations, three of them were Latinas. Two of them are getting promoted recently. That is the type of effort that we have to consciously be involved in, and it's never ending. Agreed, agreed, and but always necessary. Um, so, Grace, you know, I, I think that um, as you think about building a legacy and, and as you start to take those steps in your, your own career, it requires um, a certain amount of vision and forethought um, and really looking at where you want the company to be in a certain amount of time, where you want the employees to be in a certain amount of time. Um, but there are curveballs, right? I think this last year is, uh, you know, more than we could have possibly iman imagined, right? With a global pandemic, with the social unrest um, that took place, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world in solidarity. Um, so at, as you think about building a legacy, help our um, participants um, think of, you know, kind of think through the process of how do you build those foundational steps and take into account the things that could never be imagined. Yeah, that good good question. And and uh, you know, I think you're really talking about sustainability, right? How how do we how do we have a legacy that that's sustainable through time and challenges, etc. And I think it goes. It starts with something that you said, uh, to, Amy, to, to start is um, that it is not about. I think the first thing that you have to recognize is that it's not about you and your leadership style. You know, a lot of times we think about, well, it's about us. It's about the leader and our leadership style, and that's how we're going to get it done. I, I my uh, opinion is is that if you if you only think that it's about you and your leadership style, then everything that you build will fall apart as soon as you leave and that next person comes in. So I think the, I think there are three keys to sustainability um, and that is culture, uh, processes, and people. Um, culture, we've talked you know some about already, but that really is the glue that holds an organization together. Um, and you know, there's lots of uh, lots of literature out there on you know how you build a good culture, how you sustain a good culture. But but I think that's one piece of this sustainability. Um, the second one is processes. Um, you know, I I think you can have a great culture, um, but processes really are helpful because they provide the guardrails um, for a team. And I think that you. Uh, uh, the second part, this this uh, developing processes that are consistent with your culture, um, is really important. And sometimes, you know, people uh, think, oh, processes are bureaucratic, etc. And they don't have to be. I mean, you could have simple processes, but you know, being an engineer, <laughs> I guess I always think about you know the the beauty of a of, of a, a well thought out process. And then, uh, lastly, um, obviously, people. Um, people are where uh, you know where it all happens, right? You, and and I mentioned that in my first um, comment. I think people development is so important, putting the right people in place. So, to me, sustainability is all about um, the culture, the processes. And then the people, and I think you really have to work on all three of those. Um, you can't, you know, really just have one piece of it. Eduardo, uh, Grace said it very, very, very well. The, you know, m my thought is, in addition to, to that culture piece, is really living your values, right? So, you, you know, you're building this foundation that will would be able to withstand these these shocks. And I think that if you live your values, stay through, true to your values, your values drove your purpose. Your purpose really connects to who you are as, as a group of people, as an institution. And then from there, it's all about these very important people relationships, these partnerships with organizations like Hased and, and, and many others across your work uh, to achieve a better life for others that allow you to be able to uh, withstand these shocks that are, that are going to occur. And, and so that's, that's the way I would say, you know, we can build that sustainability. 
So Julio, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball to the question for you and add in the component of sustainability and, and intentionality with regards to Latino recruitment and retention and, you know, the future leadership of, of an organization. Right. Right. I, I think it's so important when you're thinking about the outcomes that you want for an organization to, of course, as Grace and Eduardo say, build culture, build it strongly, build it with strong foundational base, which includes values and purpose. And that then breeds sustainability. The one thing that I'm personally proud of is that when I left the CEO job of MRSA, they kept all of the purpose statements that we had. They went through a total review to make sure it was reflective of what they wanted. New leadership, of course, has the opportunity to do that. They kept it and they kept all our values in place as well, which is the first indication of some sustainability as time, time goes on. But one of the things that we did is we made diversity and inclusion one of our values. It was front and center right in there of our five values that we had. And it talked about what it meant also, respecting it, promoting it, and actioning it to ensure that things change. So you come in and you say, okay, so how do you do that from the top? You have to first look at the executive ranks. So it was great to be able to bring, for example, percent of female representation for partners and above increased from 17% to 38% in a, very, in a relatively short period of time. The executive leadership team was 50% uh, gender diverse. And then in addition to that, lifestyle and ethnically diverse also for an additional 50% of that 50%. So it was, it was pretty amazing the progress we made because we stated it purposely as being something that was important to us. The other thing that I want to mention, that it's an important time to do it right now, is that the world is very confusing today. A lot of things that are happening outside the doors of the companies are really changing people's thought process about what their country stands for, what their government stands for, et cetera, et cetera. What you want to do is create an environment that when they walk through your doors, it's very clear what the values are of that organization, what the purpose is of that organization. And for the time that you are in those doors, that is how you expect them to conduct themselves. What they do outside, unfortunately, you can't control. But what they do inside is important. And that's how you create the culture. That's how you create an environment that will be long lasting and sustainable for years and years to come. Because people want to come in those doors. They want to walk through those doors. They want to be part of that value system. They want to be part of that purpose that makes them feel that they're contributing to the world and to good things that should come out of it. That's a, such a great segue into the next um, conversation that I want to make sure that we have with you all. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I think it's been coming for some time, but I think in this last year with the social unrest that we had um, in the country that the idea of corporate citizenship had, you know, has really become a huge topic of conversation, not just within industry, but also in mainstream conversation. So Eduardo, as you, um, what advice can you give to our executives um, as they're thinking about legacy and as they're building structures to really center this idea of corporate citizenship, social responsibility, um, and, and then influencing the values moving forward? Well, this is, this is uh, you know, the world that, uh, that I've lived in for a couple of decades and really, the, the major push started, I would say, easily five to seven years ago. And I mentioned it a little bit uh, earlier about Larry Fink, you know, CEO of BlackRock, biggest institutional investor in the world, and his letter to CEOs uh, about the importance of being more than just about profits. And uh, everything that has come thereafter, including the pandemic, including the social unrest and racial reckoning that has underscored the point that uh, corporations have to be a lot more than just chasing profits. Now, the good thing is that as you can see over the last year and a half, there has been a major uh, shift in, in CEOs really embracing that point 
And, uh, and, and I believe that if you create a purpose for your company, live your values, and your employees will perform for you. Your suppliers will perform for you. Your customers will be loyal to you. And your shareholders will be well compensated because your company is going to perform. So it gets back to uh, if, a, if a company is more about that or any institution, quite frankly, you're going to create a legacy because you're going to improve the lives of many people within the walls of your company and outside the walls of your company. And I think that the last year and a half has really drawn an even brighter spotlight on this because it's not corporate citizenship and corporate social responsibility is, is a lot more than just making investments in the community. It's about diversity and inclusion. It's about your people. It's about investing in small businesses, in women-owned businesses. And, and so just think about all the levers that you can pull when you're doing that on multiple fronts, how enriched your organization is going to be and your people uh, because they see the impact that your company is having not only within the walls of the company, but you know, around the world potentially. Can I can I can I just uh, piggyback off of that, if I may? Thank you. Um, sorry, Grace. I wanted to make sure that since the point was made, um, while I agree that this started some time ago, the movement towards having a stronger civil voice from leadership within corporate America, it has really been challenged in the last twelve to eighteen months, uh, for sure, and it has been questioned as to whether or not corporate America should be involved in making statements that are supportive of their values, but making those statements externally. Mm -hmm. And almost every statement, unfortunately, has those that agree and those that don't within your own confines of your company, as well as those customers who are reading it as well. So it's a very delicate balance. And what I suggest is that an example of this, of course, the more recent example is could be said the assault on democracy when in fact you know votes that were legal and cast were said or attempted to be over over overthrown or, or thrown out because of whatever outcome someone else wanted to achieve companies came out many of them did very early many in georgia actually came out big companies and made clear statements that they were not going to support financially those those who supported the potential of not accepting the results of the people. Now that became very polarizing, unfortunately, in the world that we live today. Why did they do it? I know some of those leaders and have talked to them about it. They did it for two reasons. Number one, they were living their values. Mm -hmm. Number two, they were living their purpose. Now, if you don't have those things, foundationally set in your organization, not just in a drawer somewhere, but you're living them day in and day out, you're going to have a tough time figuring out which issues you should speak on and which issues you shouldn't. If you have that clear purpose and that clear value system and you're consistent in applying it, it'll give you the opportunity when it presents itself to be clear about where you stand and where your company stands. That doesn't mean everyone's going to agree with you. You have to accept the fact that you're not going to please everybody, customers included, by the way. It's a very difficult balance. But you still have responsibility as an organization, as a company, to be able to state that in support of your purpose and your values. Thank you. Grace? Yeah, I think the only thing, uh, Eduardo and Julio covered it very well. I think the only other thing I would add is that, you know, when you look at uh, corporate citizenship, you know, just that, that phrase, that spans a lot of things, right? I mean, it spans anywhere from diversity and inclusion to environmental friendliness to, uh, you know, political. I mean, there's it spans a, a big... Um, it's very broad. And so I, the other thing I would just suggest is that uh, whether you're the CEO or a leader in an organization, 
um, is that you figure out, you know, a couple of places where you want to make an impact um, because it's hard to uh, maybe make an impact at least to start on the whole uh, beachfront there. Um, and, and so I, I do think it's important that you, that you, uh, you know, if, and I think many organizations are, are, are ready to make some changes right now. Um, and so if you can gather, uh, rally leadership support for a couple of, uh, areas to focus on, um, I, I think you've got a lot of opportunity to make a big difference in an organization because, um, the awareness is very high right now. Like I said, a lot of leaders that I talk to are, you know, ready to do some things differently. It's just the the it's just so broad that sometimes um, an organization gets a little paralyzed. So um, again, figure out a, you know a handful of things, uh, some things to focus on, and then rally the organization around those things. The, that's such a great point, and I'm I'm going to stick with you here, Grace, because you, you what you're talking about really is looking at um, what you can control, right? What you have control over, um, and you know sometimes um, it's hard to see the forest for the trees, right? When you're trying to do your day to day work and keep your mind on this larger issue of. Um, uh, of legacy, right? And, and of how, you know, you're building, knowing, you know, all of the dynamics that, that are in place around you. So can you talk a little bit about um, sort of staying the course and also keeping your mind on that that larger piece? Well, I, I think it goes back to values. Um, I, you know, I think that if, if you can, uh, you know, again, have a clear perspective of values, your values and the organization's values. And if, and then you make decisions based on that value set. Um, I think that is the, those are your guardrails, you know, as, as you, as you go forward. And, you know, a lot of times you get um, uh, tugged and pulled in different directions um, based on lots of different constraints, right? Running a business is, is, uh, is very challenging and there's all kinds of external factors that come in. Um, but if you use your values as your guardrails in making those decisions, um, then I think you stay true to your legacy. Um, it's, it's, it's when you, and, and you know, a lot of it is, is kind of your gut. I mean, I, I, I tend to be an intuitive person and, and you know, when something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. Um, so again, I say, stay true to your values, um, you know, be very clear in your mind, um, what those are, stay true as you make decisions and take action because, you know, that the other thing that, um, somebody had said to me is people will look, people will listen to what you say, but it's what you do that really, uh, tells the tale and they're going to watch what you do. They'll listen to what you say, but they're going to watch what you do. Um, you know, to see uh, really where you're headed. And, and as a leader, even more so because, you know, you're the role model for the organization. So that's why I think that that perspective on values and staying true to them uh, is so important. Thank you. Eduardo, as we're talking about um, values and, and the expectations that, that are, you know, on you as a leader, do you have you felt in, in your career that the expectations were different because you were Latino or did you feel that you had your own different set of expectations um, because of your culture and your upbringing and who you were and what you brought to each and every role you were in? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been fortunate, obviously, you know, our, our individual values are really the, the, the summation of our family and how we were raised and our heritage and uh and and where we grew up and who we had as 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 uh, partners and mentors and um but i i do believe that my values uh were also shaped by uh by the company i worked for uh as i said you know i started when i was 16 so i essentially grew up at ups and uh and i say that very often that you know, they, you know, they taught, they were there when I was, uh, you know, a young student and a young lawyer and, and, and a young father and, and on and on and on. And, and now a grandfather. 
Uh, so I was very fortunate to work for a company that shaped my values in, in a way that uh, were consistent with the values that, uh, that I had as an individual that I was raised by my family with. And uh, so the expectations, um, you know, were, uh, were equivalent. I, I will say that <clears throat> in my role, as, as president of the foundation, as chief diversity and inclusion officer, it, it, and the great partners that, that we have externally in civil society, like Hassan, I brought, uh, we brought some, some of that value system into the company, uh, and, and the company embraced those values uh, as well. So it's an ever-changing environment. You know, we, we talk about values. I think values stay the same, but culture, culture can be managed. And it's managed by, you know, the events of the day. It's managed by uh, the, the different obstacles and challenges that society faces. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, also having uh, very, very careful partners externally uh, also can shape the values of an institution as well. Leo, do you think that Latino executives should feel a responsibility to the Latino community um, as they go about doing their work, as they go about shaping their legacy? There is no question that if we as leaders don't somehow mow a path and a clear journey for people to be able to come along for the ride, then you have to ask yourself who's going to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer is no one else. That's the answer. So for those of us who have been uh, fortunate enough to have had a career where we can have influence over that journey, and be able to bring people along for the ride, it's our responsibility to do so. No question about it. And that's why mentoring and coaching becomes such an important element of this. Yes, being outspoken about certain things also is an important element. You know, social media is uh, one of those platforms that gives uh, everybody the opportunity to be heard, uh, everybody. And so I'm relatively active on social media. Uh, you don't have to figure me out. I'm pretty much out there. and take some popular stance and take some unpopular stance to give people the opportunity to have the permission to be able to engage in these, in these uh, topics and to have an influence. So yes, I think it's extremely important that we empathetically, compassionately and, credi and with credibility um, lead the way for Latinos and Latinas to be successful in the future. And so, and we have to have a process, a better process, I think, amongst Latinos to do this as well. Um, it, it, you know, when, when I, someone comes to me and says, look, I got a board position open, we'd like to consider, you know, a female Latina for this board, I should be immediately saying, yes, I've got five people you ought to consider right away. And I know they exist. I don't always know them, though. And the opportunity may be missed because there's always a pace to these decisions. So you can't spend a lot of time researching. So hopefully one day, all of the Latino uh, organizations, uh, HACER, LCDA, et cetera, et cetera, will get together and actually build this mega pipeline database that gives people like us the opportunity to instantaneously be able to suggest candidates for boards and for C-suite positions as they come up that are very qualified or maybe a step away from that qualification. People will open themselves up to those opportunities because they want the diversity of thought as well as background on those boards. And it's a great time to be doing this because as Grace mentioned earlier, the sensitivity, the sensitivity to this amongst the C-suite has never been higher, never been. There is not, uh, you look at the recent research that shows what else, what's on CEO's minds, 92% of them in the top five had DNI. That's never happened before. That's never happened before. It's a great opportunity and we ought to be jumping on that opportunity and not struggling to kind of put ourselves in an organized fashion to be heard. So yes, we have that responsibility and there's a long way to go. Wonderful. The, 
we have, so we've got some questions that'll be coming up in, in a few minutes. Um, so, but before we get started with the questions that, that come out of the audience, Grace, can you talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, with, with your um, engineer's mind, I'm sure you, you think a lot with, between the practical, right? And the, the more nebulous uh, things. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, balancing legacy and that idea of longevity, but also innovation, right? And the idea of being innovative and adaptable at the same time. I think that um, you can build a sustainable legacy um, based on an approach of innovation. I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. Um, in fact, I think that uh, a legacy is more apt to um, endure time, challenges, et cetera, if it's not stagnant and if it's adaptable to the future. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the pieces of counsel that I give uh, people a lot um, as I'm, uh, you know, uh, just doing coaching is, uh, is adaptability. I, I think adaptability is probably one of the strongest, uh, most important characteristics uh, and I've thought that for a long time, but even more so with, you know, how, how quickly things change, um, you know, being able to get put into a different situation, a new environment, um, you know, this past year with uh, all these challenges that we've never seen before and being able to quickly, you know, assess the situation, uh, you know, define what, uh, what steps need to get taken and then take action. So that, that uh, thought of adaptability, uh, I think is very important, um, not only in terms of a person's characteristics, but, but also, you know, as, as part of your legacy. Wonderful. Well, we've got some questions coming in. The first one is from someone who says that they're in their 50s and they have been focused on their company role for, for most of their career. Um, do you have any suggestions for what he or she can do to raise their external profile at, at this stage of their career? And we'll open it up for anyone who has an answer. Yes, uh, let me give a, let me get a stab at this. Um, I think it's important as you're thinking about your career to think about all different elements. And one of them is how are you seen outside the walls of your company? And if you feel like you've done as much as you can focusing on how you're seen internally, then it's maybe time to shift to that particular view as well. And what I found always help helpful is networking with people who already have been successful in doing that and getting ideas from them. So you're asking the question because of course you're saying where we've been successful doing it and how have we done it? It's a conscious effort, a mindset that basically says, I'm gonna put myself in a position to be, to have opinions and to have statements to, to say about important aspects of what's going on in society, in the world and in the business segment that you carry yourself in. There are a lot of different industry groups that will give you a, a voice and opportunity to learn and to also be involved in making decisions for the industry. And I would strongly encourage that you get involved in those organizations. And then of course, based on what your personal purpose is, what you feel matters most to you, there are a lot of organizations, again, that are there at the waiting and ready for you to get involved in and to improve your profile. And don't ever forget, I know I mentioned this earlier, social, social networking, in the stratosphere of, of, of social platforms has never been more readily available to us than it is today. And I know that people have varied degrees of interest in being involved, but they can serve uh, very well in the arena of being able to promote or ultimately build your external brand. You know, can I jump in on, on that one? I, I think, I, and I fully agree with that, Something really simple that that you can start with is uh, get your LinkedIn profile um, and 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 get that uh, shaped up because uh, somebody gave me that advice as I was nearing uh, retirement and you know I had just kind of put some stuff in there um, but uh, there's some articles out there about how to build in a, a, a build a good LinkedIn profile. And just that is great because people search LinkedIn profiles. And um, I think that's, you know, that can be one piece of your face uh, to the external world. Easy to do, but um, a lot of times we just don't take the time to do it. 
Yeah, I agree. I think uh, the, those uh, social media platform, LinkedIn being probably the most prominent, uh, is very important to, to leverage. And then, as Julio pointed out, uh, networks. Your networks uh, are so important. Putting in the time to help others will give you that profile as a leader. Uh, organizations like Kased, and, and, and there are a, a cascading amount of others that, uh, depending on, on what your focus is, can give you that, uh, that not only profile, but also that experience that, that you need um, to, uh, to develop your, your, your street cred, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> We have another question. Um, this individual says that their company is very supportive of um, their work on nonprofit boards. Um, and the question is, did nonprofit boards help you get in onto corporate boards or do they need to change their strategy to get noticed for corporate boards? I, I can start on that one. I, I, uh, I was on some uh, not-for-profit uh, boards uh, before I joined my first corporate board. I'm not sure, frankly, I mean, it was good for me and, and I, I think good for the organization. I'm not sure that that really helped me um, get noticed uh, for the corporate boards. Um, my turning point was uh, really positional when I, when I uh, took the uh, president of GM Mexico and then GM Brazil, you know, that's when I, I think I started to get on people's radar. But the other thing that I did that was really helpful and I think might have um, also helped to, to get uh, noticed is I took a course on corporate governance uh, at, um, this one I took was at uh, Kellogg in, in Chicago. Um, and it was for women. It was like uh, women on boards. It was three days. Um, it was it was exceptional for me because it taught me a lot about governance that I didn't really know. But it also uh, they the people the women who go through that course they put them on a list. And so when recruiters external recruiters are looking for women, that's one of the sources. And so I think that doing stuff like that NACD um, it you know is an, a, another uh, good source. Uh, but I think taking a course like that and then, um, you know, being able to get in those uh, networks and searches uh, is also helpful. Yeah. You know, I, I think that you shouldn't join a nonprofit board unless you're passionate about what that organization does. So let's just start with that as an initial litmus test. But if you do, if you're able to get on a, a national board, uh, a board like uh, an organization like Hased or Unidos US, uh, that, you know, members of the board of those organizations are a great network, right? You're, you're probably going to be elbow to elbow with, with representatives from, from other major organizations. So, so I do believe that that is, is a great opportunity. Secondly, uh, you will get a little bit of a flavor for the governance uh, of a board, uh, although I, I don't, I don't believe that uh, they're nearly as parallel. It all depends on how well, uh, uh, and how well organized the board is on, on the nonprofit side. But, but I do think that uh, picking the right board, a national board, could get you engaged with uh, many uh, uh, colleagues that could be significant down the road. <clears throat> Yeah. The another question that we've got is: Is a leadership role necessary to establish a legacy? Can anyone create a lasting legacy? Just as anyone can be a leader, despite their title. Yes, anybody can. The principles of creating a legacy are the same, whether you're a leader or you're not. The difference might be that you might be able to create a more awareness of the broader legacy if you are in a leadership position versus one that's you know, in, the, in the organization and has less influence over your, your sphere. So, but I think it's still the same, right? So uh, you think about legacy. Firstly, let me just be very clear. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about legacy and it wasn't until I was going towards the end of my career when people started asking, so what legacy do you think you've established and what do you want to be known for? Uh, and now that you're stepping into another st stage of your life, 
And quite frankly, it's the first time I thought about it. And because you, know, you focus on doing a great job, you focus on people, you focus on, on building you know, a sustainable organization over time, and the rest of it is left up to everybody else to figure out whether or not you had a legacy that, or what that legacy was. But if you, think, if, you, if you do want to plan out legacy, the more that I thought about it, the more I think it's important to, 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 to think about what impact you had on others. So what, what are you doing when others say you make your biggest contribution? So what are others saying that you are doing that's making a big impact on them? And that starts to then formalize in your own mind what that legacy may look like. So do what matters uh, along those lines of the impact that people say you are having. And so if, they, if, if many of them say your ability to be able to bring clarity to developing people's careers over time and the interest you take in that, then it's around people. And, 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 and the first people you gotta think about when you think about legacy is if you are fortunate enough and blessed to have children, our, our biggest, deepest you know, legacy is our children, you know, our, our kids. You know? uh, they are our greatest legacy and the focus that's necessary there is important. Then take that to the next step it's about people that you interact with and that people you want to make a difference with in your corporate life as well. So start thinking about them in those terms. You know, people tend to, to bring out the things that you really have an impact on. Start kind of coalescing those things and maybe a legacy starts ultimately uh, coming out of it. This has been such a remarkable conversation and I don't want to leave without asking you one final question. We're short on time, but I want to make sure that the, the folks who are here with us hear from you. Can you tell us the one thing you want to be remembered for? I'd, I'd like to be remembered as a leader who helped others achieve their potential. Um, I still hear from people that I mentored a long time ago and it's just so rewarding to know that you had a small part in someone's success. Thank you. Eduardo? I can't give you one. I'm going to give you two. Um, sure. First, humanitarian issues in the global south, whether it be health, the refugee crisis, that's one passion. The other is being an advocate for women around the world. I think that without a doubt, when you look at women's position around the world, it's, it's a disgrace. And I think that we all need to do more to lift women uh, in, in, around the world, in the United States, outside of the United States. So those are, the, those are my two passions. And then, of course, as Julio said, familia, that's, <laughs> you know, that's the key. Thank you so much, Julio. I, uh, when, when, the, when the note came out, announcing my retirement, the uh, chairman of the board very clearly articulated what he thought the legacy was. And his view was that we brought diversity and inclusion to the C-suite and that we made it an important element of our decision-making process and that Julio was constantly questioning those decisions as they were made to ensure that those discussions were had so that we can have a meaningful impact on the business results of the organization. Because I thoroughly believe and still do today that focusing on diversity is a business issue that allows for better results. And since our number one quest as public companies is to ensure that we are maximized business results, then it would be irresponsible not to also focus on DEI as an important element of achieving those results. Thank you all so much for this conversation. Thank you for the generosity of your time. We're so grateful to have heard your insights and, and your stories. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Sid to close out our event. Well, well thank you, uh, Amy. And of course, a big thank you to Grace Liebline, Julio Portalatine, 
uh, and, and Martinez for such a great topic on building a lasting legacy. I can tell you personally, these are three of my inspirations. You know, what Grace Leeline did at General Motors, rising up the ladder and leading major uh, operations uh, and continue to stay involved is great. And what Ed Martinez did over his 44 years at UPS, uh, rising up to be lead the UPS Foundation and, uh, and and being Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer and just his commitment to the community has been so great. And Hulu for the team, you know, it's just what he did rising up and becoming the CEO of Mercer and then Vice Chairman Marsh McClendon. Um, you know, it's just so inspiring. And I think that uh, I hope everyone sees the value that uh, that you, too, if you focus on making a positive difference at your company, you, too, can build a lasting legacy like these three amazing leaders. And of course, uh, you know, each of them have made a lasting difference, as I said, um, what, you know, Grace Liebline did in really uh, promoting uh, Latinas, particularly in STEM, has really been a lasting legacy. And I'll even just say as a personal privilege that Ed and Julio um, are like my Davos Padrinos, uh, because as a result of their support, uh, we continue to have a presence at the World Economic Forum in Davos, thanks to the lasting legacy that they did when we first started getting involved. So a big thank you to them. And thank you, Amy, for uh, moderating a great session. Thank you.